Where is that switch? Where is switch? Sorry? I pick, stole it. Thanks. <clears throat> I hope the microphone works. Yes. Hello to everyone. Very nice to meet. As Marek says, my current background is art history and art theory and also restoration. Uh, but yes, I started as biologist and Kalevi Kull was my first teacher. And thank you, Kalevi. And uh, I will speak now as <clears throat> art historian. Uh, whose standpoints and lectures are based on the theory of evolution and biosemiotics. In fact, art historian is not an extremely correct term here. Um, we use the term science of art, Kunstwissenschaft, because for a long time the focus has not been on history at all. Focus lies on theory and dynamics of changes in art field in general. Uh, but I am only talking about this for clarification. So let's move to the main topic. I will discuss some questions <clears throat> of contemporary art theory from the perspective of biology-based art theorists. So that's mean this is almost like case studies. I am sure that um, our culture is in a phase of knowledge in which studying and interpreting depictive behavior, if we want to achieve reasonable results, needs to be based on the theory of evolution and biology. But why? One simple example. Mm. Let's move the slide. Depictive behavior starts with the very first stone tools. Actually, it starts earlier. But we have no evidence about all these dashes and lines which were drawn on sand or ground. But we have these stone tools. And uh, dating varies uh, maybe 1.5 million years ago, maybe 2 million years ago. And uh, there is also this possibility that 3.3 uh, million ago we can find some objects which we can interpret as stone tools. Uh, quite likely, creating stone tools was synchronized uh, with the appearance uh, of symbolic behavior, with symbolic ability overall. Symbolic ability did not appear out of nowhere nowhere, like a buoy released from a deep, dark water. It was based on the long evolution of consciousness in living creatures. But in contemporary culture, we can barely see or accept these the long durée connections. Mm, of course, <clears throat> no one is in today's humanities denies the validity of the theory of evolution. However, I do not see biological knowledge being utilized in a fundamental way in the processes of interpretation of art and depictive behavior. It is simply formal knowledge. It is there, but it's basically outside of frame. I hope here is inside frame, <laughs> but not always. Art theory is moving along its own trajectory and biology-based knowledge doesn't get to influence its path anywhere. There simply is no confluence. That is not ignoring or exclusion. There is nothing malicious about it. There is simply not enough contact surface between these two fields. In my lectures in the Estonian Academy of Arts, I have tried to create that confluence in order to forge an understanding of the creative processes of works of art and the characteristics of the materials that shape these processes, I prefer to start with the process of evolution, the emergence of vision in the Cambrian explosion and how living beings survived among the physical force lines created by hostile and maiming materials 
and by other living creatures who are also hostile and maiming. When artists work with materials, they use experiences that have been developed in the struggle for survival throughout evolution. That means that the decisions and choices we make in our creative work are not reducible to merely culture-based explanations. You can see I use here this good old fear of reductionism, but in reversed way. This problem has, of course, been noticed. Both art and art theory have by now realized that understanding nature is indeed critical. In creative arts, as well as in the field of theory and interpretation, people are searching for opportunities to adjust their topics and integrate conservation of nature and ecological issues in their fields of activity. I'm convinced that without delving into biology and biosemiotics, these endeavors will not get very far. In culture, we are used to appreciate the power of interpretation. Natural sciences presume knowledge of rather strict facts and principles originating from physical reality. The space for free interpretations is narrower. And that is a good thing. We have to go outside and look what the animals and plants are doing there in order to understand what we are doing. What we are doing uh, with a little example, mm, and this is about observations, what I mean. We have to go outside and uh, observe these processes. Uh, you can clearly see here two pictures uh, about wrestling. Uh, one of them shows uh, wrestling in reality. The second one is uh, pure fantasy. No one wrestles. So, and a uh, little bit ironically, uh, Courbet was uh, known as realist, but that's not real. Uh, I guess that now is time to give some examples. What do I exactly do in my lectures? My students are most frequently first grade art bachelor students, but they can be master's degree students also. Okay, we have the first lecture about early creative and depictive behavior of human species, and we start from, from Cambrian explosion. But why? Why to start with Cambrian explosion? Because that was the place and time where the eye appeared on the evolutionary stage. Depictive behavior as we know it today is possible only because there is a concept of eye, the concept of vision. And if we want to understand and analyze the process of creating the visual arts, we have to start from the beginning, from the eye because that was a fundamental strategical shift in perception of three-dimensional space. All of us who use our eyes are part of this strategic shift. And uh, we have to know that this is 540 million years long developmental arc. And also students have to know what we also need to know there is one big problem with the eye. There are no good fossils formed from the eyes because eye tissue is soft. I'm talking about this softness because when you study art, you have to understand the materials. Softness is one of the material properties, and the student must understand how it affects the afterlife of the object. Understanding an object is linked with an understanding of its material. In physical reality, in nature, the eyes disappear from existence. And we cannot study the development of vision quite consistently because there are not enough fossils. But sometimes scientists are just lucky. Until recently, the best old eye for science was found near Tallinn from Savirana, Kallavera. It's almost, almost here. I don't have any more recent data at the moment, uh, but this eye is an approximately 500 million year old trilobite visual organ. This tissue is well preserved, and it is quite clear 
that it resembles the eye of modern arthropods, which means that the composite eye already existed in a considerable form by that time. All this body of knowledge, paleontology, fossils, the evolution of the eye, the material of the eye and its softness, all combined will give the student an idea of natural reality on which a their painting or clay molding or photography is based. In this way, one can hope that art student will begin to understand how we, we have grown out from nature with all our creative potential. After such connections, evolution is no longer a formal theory that simply exists somewhere without affecting culture and artistic creation. Now that knowledge becomes directly related to personal existence and activities. Or I hope so. <laughs> and this information gives the students perspective about the time scale regarding questions of vision and also an understanding of how we do, uh, do we relate uh, to other animals who can see. I have her title, The Lesser Noddy and the Grand Devil's Claw. That sounds like some old scary tale. And that is a little bit scary. Hey, that, that is fundamentally scary. Uh, I am quite sure that if someone wants to understand physical processes or animals, they have to go outside and look carefully and contemplate what they see. I mean, uh, they have to do some research. It is not enough to live like a medieval monk who reads Aristotle and Pliny the Elder and never studies how a pelican actually lives. So let's take, for instance, the relationship of animals and their materials in their environment. The contact of animals with materials and objects is Intexically silent and physical. Uh, silent means without words here, not total silence, of course. Uh, let's take a closer look at some complex problem, complex problem solutions that require instrumental dexterity. An example would be the situation of the chicks of the lesser noddy when they start learning how to fly. They live in the Seychelles. Quite at the same time, as the chicks start to fly, fruits of the Grand Devil's Claw, Bisonia Grandis, are ripe, and they are large, hooked, and sticky. When the chicks start to fly, the fruits are ready to stick to them. It's quite likely that some of the fruits will be able to move to a more distant place that is suitable for growing. That is what plants do. Actually, it is a pretty good plan, uh, but uh, it is not without its errors. If too much fruit sticks to the young bird, the bird will no longer be able to fly, and the result is, of course, a dead bird. To survive, a young bird must be able to apply sophisticated instrumental dexterity, and also, it has never done anything like this before. It must understand how to peck sticky seeds out of its plumage. This is comparable to the dexterity required to use the tools. The bird that copes with this unpleasant and dangerous problem survives, but the one that lacks the necessary physical capacity dies. Let's take a closer look at this complex issue. The bird must be able to understand what prevents it from flying, what the nature of the object is, how it sticks and how to remove the dangerous object from its plumage using engineering ingenuity without attaching even more similar harmful objects to itself. All of these activities require effective recognition of physical materials and their properties. The relentless solving of such problems over hundreds of millions of years in infinitely many branches of evolution has created an extremely comprehensive database of physical skills. 
We stay alive because we have this toolbox with us to use. But we also use this toolbox to physically create objects of art. Both of these activities rely on the same basis. And some example for using tools, old Estonians, and their so. Uh, these were all rather descriptive and clear examples. I can say quite simple examples. It is possible that we should talk about some more theoretical ways of connecting these two fields of thinking and doing. Let's look at what can be done to differentiate between biosemiotics-based coding methods regarding the ways how living beings, beings understand materials and what do they do with materials. Usually, I tell art students first before we get to the behavior of materials a uh, little about famous biosemiotics Jesper Hofmeier and uh, his idea of dual coding. Of course, the idea of digital and analog coding is nowhere near Hofmeier's idea. But uh, his innovation lies in a way of looking at their interac interactions. I am sure that, in fact, everyone here knows what the difference between digital and analog coding is. But just for the sake of coherence, I will still give you a very brief insight of how we talk about these two ways of coding in our art theory lecture hall. It is quite clear that for the most part the world is experienced through physical contacts and lines of force in analog code. And this experience has no direct link to language and digital code. Of all, this is, uh, all of this is obviously not so simple, but uh, let's stay as simple as possible now here. Uh, first of all, those two modalities, digital coding and analog coding, should be distinguished from each other. The word digital comes from the Latin word for finger, digitus. And the digital code is quite generally a code based on symbols that, like the fingers, are discontinuous. For instance, the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, or the letters of any writing system or alphabet. Jesper Hofmeier emphasizes that the prior invention of the book was already based on a digital code of letters. So, the modern popular distinction between digital electronic media and old-fashioned books is dangerously misleading when it comes to clear understanding of codes. The alter uh, alternative to digital code is analog code. Hofmeier explains the principle of anal analogy as follows. In an old watch, for instance, the pointers circle the watch dial in a kind of analogy of the perceived rotation of the sun around the Earth. In the same way, the height of the mercury column in a thermometer can be said to an analog, analog way coding of a hand eh, eh, reflects the magnitude of the actual temperature. One might also call a glove an analog coding of a hand. In a certain sense, one might even see the wings of the bird as analog codification of the aerodynamic properties of air currents. Most broadly speaking, digital codes are arbitrary, as symbolic sign relations generally are, and require some form of external agreement to be understood. Hofmeier refers to this in the general part of his theory. Digital codes are necessarily based on symbolic signs, whereas analog codes are based on icons and or indices. What happens in the physical domain through analog coding is largely the field of tacit knowledge, formulated only very generally to add to the discreteness of digital sparsity. Words simply do not have sufficient access to the continuity of physical processes. Much of this tacit knowledge is obviously attached to general wordings, approximate ref references, and their use in language is internalized to such an extent that this designation is done in intuitively. The content of tacit knowledge 
never appears in the conscious layers of linguistic actualization. At the same time, this tacit knowledge is actually the field of experience on the basis of which art is made. In this way, we begin to see, and art students begin also, a place where formulation and making do not meet and cannot meet at all. And this is important to understand. People say boats float and bird flies. These phrases seem sufficient to describe floating and flying. Actually, that is not the case. The content behind these processes is known only to a skilled shipbuilder or an engineer of biomechanics. We have here an idea that sea encodes boats, selecting the functional ones from among them, or that bird encodes the air with its wings and interprets the subtleties of air currents to stay in the air and survive. The ideas are unexpected from the perspective of everyday thinking about what birds do or what boats do or what air and water, that is, materials do. And now this idea guides art students to understand their creative processes not by generalization, but by focusing on physical, silent, and technical complexities, even if they are completely distant, if they, even if they are completely distant from words. And of course they are, very often they are completely distant from words. This is tacit knowledge. And after that, students understand what does it mean to say that a blacksmith encodes metal with a hammer. It is no longer a poetic expression, now it is filled with content related to their own daily creative activities. I have two, two little examples. Uh, these examples, uh, what do you use in our, our lecture hall? And these examples, uh, uh, I guess, will illustrate uh, what means uh, context and what means uh, uh, point of changing point of view. Uh, I hope you, were, you looked at uh, clearly what you see there. Old petroglyph <laughs> or cave painting, actually, of course not. That is uh, Banksy work. That is work what, uh, what was placed in British Museum for maybe for three days before they found that. And uh, that, is, uh, that is named uh, Early Man Goes to Market. <laughs> and this is real, El Castillo. <laughs> and this is really that old. And uh, another picture, I can say, I can ask, uh, like Morpheus asked from Neo, uh, do you think these are camels, what you see? Yeah, it's uh, quite, uh, quite right that uh, these are actually shadows of camels. And uh, why I show that picture, if uh, you look at these shadows, it's quite similar what we can see in petroglyph. And uh, some, some de depicting ways can uh, found from nature. Maybe the artist who made them looked shadows of animals and then did that perspective black magic what we can see in petroglyphs and cave paintings often. Thank you. <laughs>